to us and uh, praise Him for all that God is doing in our lives. Thank Him for His presence this morning and I just praise Him. Sister Lana Barlow is going to come sing. You pray for her this morning as she sings. Uh, I want to uh, read a uh, note here from Sister Gail. Uh, some of y'all know uh, Sister Gail cannot, uh, uh, she can't speak anymore, but praise God, can't she sing and praise Jesus, amen, hallelujah, uh, and uh, uh, I know uh, last Sunday morning she just about got raptured all the way out, she's standing up trying to get the Lord to take her on, amen. Uh, but Revelation uh, chapter 3 and verse number 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him uh, and he with me. Aren't you glad? Praise God. He knocks on our door. Amen. Then uh, here's what here's their testimony. Uh, I, I was saved uh, 60, uh, 63 years old. Wednesday, November the 8th, 2000 uh, at two o'clock p.m. Thank you for being my Lord and Savior, King, friend, and strength to go on. Thank you for saving. Uh, thank you for saying you will be there till the end. Thank you for the promise. You'll return for me. Hallelujah. How many of you glad today for His promises? Amen. And we praise God. All right, Sister Landa, you come and sing whatever the Lord lays on your heart. And if He sings, uh, if He lays on your heart, King of who I am, you just sing it. Amen. <laughs> but whatever the Lord lays on your heart, there, Sister. <laughs> I do want to thank the Lord so much for saving my soul. For years, I lived a life very ungodly and very unhappy. And I thank the Lord so much for showing me in His Word that He had never made me a, that new creature that He makes you once you become one of His. My life has never been the same. And I thank Him so much. I just want to praise Him this morning and tell Him I love Him. Y'all please pray for me this morning. Oh my. 
my sin He forgives Every trial is won through the blood So I rest my case at the cross Amen. I'm glad the cross where Jesus shed his blood uh, will set us free from every sin, bring forgiveness in our life. And uh, thank God through the resurrection, we are justified forever. Amen. And praise God one day. Hey, we're going to see his face because of what he did on the cross. And thank God for his blessings. This time, I'm going to ask Brother Steve Carey, a friend of mine, and appreciate uh, Brother Steve and what he does and uh, his commitment to follow the Lord. Uh, he travels all over the United States and uh, other, other countries also, uh, sharing the good news of Jesus. And I appreciate Brother Steve. He'll tell a little more about his ministry and uh, then about what's going to happen tonight. Uh, so I uh, want you to go out and invite everybody you know to come tonight. Be a great blessing. And uh, just thank God for his goodness. Amen. Brother Steve, you come and share with us what's on your heart, brother. Test one, two. Hi. How's everybody doing? How about that singing? How about that singing? Come on. Give her a hand. That was powerful. Man. Woo. I'm ready to break some bricks. Come on. You feel it? I feel, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Can I get an amen? Come on. You know what, folks? I, I'm jealous of that voice. If you heard me sing, you'd know why God gave me muscles. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Come on, I can't sing and I can't play an instrument, but you know what? I break stuff really good. Can I get an amen, church? You know what? I am so excited to be back, and, and Pastor Nikki, my friend, and uh, Brother Matt, I, I'm just so grateful to be back to a church. Thank God in heaven for a hero church that's after souls, is after revival, that is after people that are lost, hurting, broken, bankrupt, and they're willing to get out of the box and let Jesus be Lord. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. And you know what? Hey, I, I can't tell you. I, I, I don't have enough time to tell you the souls that have been saved this year through Megaforce Ministries. Now, I know some of you are wondering like, Brother Steve, you know, ripping a phone book or snapping a baseball bat. I broke 34 baseball bats in under a minute for a Guinness Book of World Records. I'm going for 40 this next year. 
praise God. And um, I got to be on Walker, Texas Ranger. I, I got to, you know what, be on Ripley's, believe it or not, ESPN. Hey, you got to love Chuck Norris. Now, come on. Come on. Everybody loves Chuck Norris. Amen. Come on. That's, that's like Bible right there. Amen. You know what? Chuck Norris, man, he's awesome man of God. Loves Jesus with all of his heart. Sold out for God. And Man, I've got to be around some great, great people and be on some great TV shows. I even got to be on recently. I was on America's Got Talent. Now get this. I ran through three two-by-fours with a flex on my chest as they burst into flames, turned around and ran and, and, and tackled a wall of ice eight feet thick that were stacked like dominoes. You know what? I did say, woo-hoo, after I hit those ice blocks, I was seeing stars. Woo-hoo, hallelujah. I thought I was on my way to heaven, Brother Nicky. I mean, I do some crazy stuff. And, and I say all that to say this, and, and people go, but Brother Steve, what does that all have to do with Jesus? Nothing. There is nothing holy about slamming your arm into a wall of concrete. Can I get an amen, church? God, use, God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Can I get an amen? And let's just all be in agreement, church. If we're going to do this, let's do it now. There ain't nothing more foolish than slamming your arms into concrete and breaking baseball bats. Amen? So let's just all be in agreement. Now, here's the thing. God's given me a unique talent and ability to do what I do. Tonight at 7 o'clock, I'm going to break bricks. I'm going to rip license plates. I have an announcement to make. If you have extra phone books, bring them. If you have extra license plates, bring them. I'm going to rip two license plates at the same time. If someone doesn't bring license plates, I'll just go in the parking lot and help myself. Glory to God. Amen. Come on, somebody. And you know what? We'll do it all for Jesus. Amen. I'm going to rip three phone books taped together at one time. I'm going to snap a baseball bat. It takes 400 pounds of pressure to snap a ball bat over your leg. I'm going to hit the concrete, smash through three feet of concrete. People always ask me, number one question, I've been doing this ministry, now watch this, 20 years traveling around the world. We are on track, Brother Nikki, this year to exceed 20 thousand people making commitments in their heart for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that's a hand clap for Jesus. Amen? I mean, we are seeing souls saved like never before. And, and so tonight, you know what? We're not, we don't want just, oh, well, that's good for the kids. Are you kidding me? We're seeing more dads saved in our meetings than we ever have in all of the last two years. We're seeing, hey, you know what God's saying? I'm going to get the head of the household. We can get the dad saved and on fire for God. We can get the whole family to the church house. Bless God. Come on. You know what? Tonight, I'm going to do all I can do. But Brother Nikki, if Jesus don't show up, it's all in vain. Because I'm here to tell you, yeah, Steve may flex a little of his puny muscles, but when God flexes his muscle, you better look out, folks, because he's going to pour the Holy Ghost out. And you know what? Two weeks ago, the mayor of the city came to my meeting and got saved. Folks, he brought his whole family. The next night, his wife and two kids got saved. We haven't seen what we're seeing in the last two years. You know what? And let me be honest. Let me be very blunt with you, church. I can come up here and preach a message tonight. And Brother Nikki, you could preach a message. We don't need another little message. We need a God happening. We need God to show up big time. And you know what's been happening? We've been seeing the atmosphere change to the counties we've been going in. And you know what? Crosslink Church up the road, I was there three months ago. We had over 500 people show up that night. And over 142 decisions for Jesus. On paper, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, revival is happening. And you know what? Hey, if I came and preached in my suit and tie, how many know, folks, the culture we live in today, it's a sight and sound generation. Can I be honest with you? And you know what? They may not come and hear me preach, but they'll come and see me break a stack of concrete. How many know they're not just going to come from the world, come in the church? we got to go to where they are. Amen? And you know what? I'm trying to do that every single week. And I'm on the road 38 weeks a year. Man, we're traveling full time. We're seeing souls saved. We'll see 20,000 plus saved. And tonight, I want to challenge you to show up. Hey, and don't come empty handed. Bring that big, tough redneck that would never darken the door of this church. My friend, Pastor Harry Wonderland in Harrisburg, PA, he had been inviting his neighbor to his church for 18 years, the First Baptist Church. He wouldn't come to a cantata. 
He wouldn't come to the candlelight service. He wouldn't come for any special service. He didn't even come for the fish fry. You know that's some serious anti-God when you ain't coming for the fish fry, amen? He would not step foot on that property till one day Pastor Harry walked in with a, a card, Brother Nicky, and said, here's my friend, I'm bringing Steve Kerr. He said, I saw that dude. He's coming to your church. He was on Walker. He said, yeah, he's coming to my church. He showed up early to help me stack the bricks that night. And you know what? He didn't get saved. He got so radically saved. The next night, he brought his whole family and got saved and hasn't missed a Sunday school class in years. Folks, I'm telling you, God is just pouring His Spirit out on all men. In this day and age we're living in, we need revival. And you know what? I'm willing to do whatever it takes. You know what? If it means snapping a bat, I'll do it. If it means breaking a brick, hey, I'll do it. If it means leaving my family week after week, I'll do it. It's a sacrifice. But moms and dads and grandparents, look right here. I get to go. I've been doing this 20 years. And I get to go where no preachers get to go in America today. You know where I believe we need to be? Listen to this. I get to go to the greatest mission field, I believe, in the world. We should go to Africa and India, I believe all that. Missions to around the world. But how many know our public schools need a miracle today like never before, folks? We, we are in a life and death struggle for our kids and our youth like never before. Can I get an amen, church, folks? I'm telling you, we're seeing things in the schools that I never thought I would ever see 20 years ago. Do you know they're telling me, the counselors now, the rage in the 18-year-olds or in the 8-year-olds now? Brother Matt, Matt, is it true? We're seeing it all. He's a teacher. He sees it every day. You know what? Bullying is an epidemic. School starts back. Per day, 165,000 kids will not go to school in fear of being bullied. Suicide, second leading killer of our kids. 1.2 million teen alcoholics this next year. You know the number one item purchased back to school this year, Brother Nikki. you know what it'll be? Bulletproof backpacks. Did you hear about the teacher turned her back on her class? This was before the school year in. The, the two kids came up and set her on fire. Folks, I'm telling you, the devil is on an all-out assault and attack, and he's playing for keeps. And you know something? How many know us good church folks, we can't just sit in our churches and go, well, I hope it gets better. Come on. We've got to invade the devil's territory and say enough's enough. And we've got to raise a standard against it in Jesus' name. And you know what? I'm on the front lines every week. Can I make an announcement? You know what? This, this next year, I'm going to be in a record 200 plus school assemblies. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a record for our ministry. I get to go where no preachers get to go. And guess what? When I go into the school, guess what I do? Pray God's anointing comes on the school. And kids come up after the assembly. A few months ago, a kid came up in middle school, seventh grade, said, Mr. Steve, thanks for what you said today. I'm not going to kill myself. He brought his daddy to the night revival, Brother Nicky. His dad was an alcoholic. And his mom was a drug addict. She never went to church. The whole family got saved and got baptized. And the next week I went to another city and a 16-year-old girl came up and said, Steve, my daddy will never come to my volleyball games. He calls me an idiot every day and says I'll never amount to anything. She brought him to that revival, man, like tonight, 7 o'clock. Her daddy came out and he got so saved. He came to, he never missed another volleyball game. And all he does is cheer her on and he's our greatest cheerleader now. And doesn't call her names anymore. And the whole family got saved. How many know that's the impact we got to make in our schools, folks? If we reach the kids, we can reach the family. Amen? Come on, somebody. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. It's not easy. But you know what? I have parents and grandparents that hug me every week in churches with tears streaming down their face saying, Steve, we don't know what to do. My son's away from God. My daughter's away from God. We raised them in church. They know about the Bible. We raised them in Sunday school and church camp. And they're with the wrong people. Well, you know what, folks? That's why I'm on a mission. That's why I'm willing to go where the preachers can't go. And you know what? I may not be able to preach Jesus in the school. That would be the worst thing I could do in America's schools. Isn't that interesting? I go to Nicaragua. First thing they ask me, would you preach in our schools? 
Land of the free, home of the brave. The worst thing I could do, folks. I find it ironic. On our money, it says, in God we trust. Good enough for our money? But why is it not good enough for our kids in this generation? Come on, somebody. It ain't going to start in the White House. It's going to start in God's house. Amen. Let's give Jesus a hand clap this morning. Praise God. That's why I've made it my life's mission for over 20 years to keep going, to keep reaching them. Now, I know, hey, for some of you, breaking a bat, that's not your thing. I get that. I get that. Believe me. But you know what? It might be your neighbor's thing. It might be that person from work that would never darken the door of this church. It just might be their thing. Amen? Because you know what? It's not the bait. It, what I have is a bait and hook. Come on, when you go fishing, man, you don't just throw an empty hook in the water, do you? you got to put the right bait to catch the right fish. Come on. I first took my wife fishing. She hated to put the worm on the hook, so I did it for her one day. Threw that line in the water. A few minutes later, she got a bite into that fishing pole. She pulled, hooked that catfish. Man, praise God. Boy, she was just excited. And Brother Nicky was almost pulling her over the bow of the boat. Boy, she was winding that thing up, cranking. And I said, here, honey, let me help you. You know what she did? She won't admit it this morning, but she did do this. She took her pointed, sharp, razor point elbow, boom, right in my rib and said, get out of the way. This is my fish. I'm reeling it in. I don't need your help. But you know what? Think about it. As a Christian, you don't be in love with, with, with the bait. You got, but as a Christian, born again on our way to heaven, filled with the Holy Spirit, we've got to be in love with catching the fish. Come on, somebody. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. Bless the Lord. Amen. So tonight at 7 o'clock, get, hey, get on Facebook, get on Twitter, get the word out. I don't want, hey, I want a meeting tonight that will change the atmosphere of this whole county. Praise God. Amen. And you know what? God's going to get the glory. We're going to see a record altar call. This isn't a youth event. It's a family event. Can I get an amen? We, how many know we need the families to come together like never before? Praise God. And this day we live in in our country, all of hell is fighting to destroy our families. And I'm just not going down without a fight. Praise God. Hey, 20 years of doing it, people say, well, when are you going to retire? I haven't seen retirement in the Bible. Bless God. Hallelujah. We're going to keep going. That's why I'm just, Brother Nicky, thank you for having me. I'm so pumped when I'm around this guy. He's so full of the Lord. When I talk to him on the phone, it's like, bless the Lord. Praise the Lord, man. I'm like ready to preach, man. I just, you, you know what? If anyone have anything negative to say about your pastor, I'd like you to meet me out back right after service. We have... We have the laying on of hands ministry. Praise the Lord. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Bless the Lord. Boy, you are blessed to have pastors that are out of the box. Amen. For Jesus, praise the Lord. I'm going to be sharing the next couple minutes. And uh, I want you to hear these words. And I mentioned some of this when I was here last time, but I think it's fitting. We have a. How many were here last time got to see me do what I do last time? How many were not here when I was here last Whoa. We got a whole new crowd. Praise the Lord. You know what? We're going to have a good time tonight. I need license plates, and I need phone books, and I need lots of them. Amen? So you show up, but i got to warn you, get here early because it's going to be a full house. Change your plans if you have plans. Hey, bring that somebody that needs a touch from Jesus tonight. I'm going to be reading out of Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, 1 through 12. If you have your Bibles, turn there, Mark 2, 1 through 12. But I'm going to intro this kind of like this. As you're turning there, I want to tell you why I love this passage I'm about to read to you. And it's going to, my heart is souls. My heart is for the pastors to get the new families in their church. And as we look at this, I've got a question for everybody here. Mark 2, 1 through 12. When you have it, say amen. <clears throat> I have a question for Poovey's Chapel this morning. I want us to look at this. I've been soul winning for 20 years, travel around the world. People ask me, do you get hurt? Yes, I do. People ask me, does it hurt when you snap a bat over your leg? Every single time. Here's the question. Look right here. Poovy's Chapel, what would it look like if we had an insatiable appetite to win our friends, our family, and, and our neighborhoods to Jesus Christ? What would it look like if we weren't afraid of someone's opinion about what we would say about the gospel. 
What would that look like? It's going to look like the story I'm about to read to you about four men. You see, I, I talk to a lot of pastors. Brother Nikki, I'm with pastors every week. And we talk about evangelism. And I mentioned a pastor before I came up here. Some of the churches I go to, they're not Poovey's Chapel. Brother Steve, what do you mean? What I'm saying, I'm going to be honest. I'm not being ugly. It's like preaching in a funeral home. Does anybody catch my drift? Amen. I'm not being ugly. I'm not being mean. But there is no spirit flowing. It's dead. It's religion. It's what I call churchianity. Well, churchianity, you just grow up in church. I, I do church. Christianity, you grow up in Christ. Amen. Oh, what? You grow up in Christ. See, there's a big difference because when you grow up in Christ, He changes you and the Holy Spirit from the inside out. And you walk with the fruits of the Spirit. You're not walking in the flesh. Old things are gone. The new comes. Well, People here, I walk in full of the joy of the Lord. People are excited about Jesus. I talk about evangelism with a lot of pastors. And you know what? A lot of times it's just talk. Well, I'll ask, what are you doing to win the lost? Well, we, we, we do church. Huh? Well, we do, we do our church services twice a week. We're good. I talked to one pastor the other day on the phone. I said, brother, I'd like to come, join hands with you, reach your community, see your church grow. You know what he said? Oh, we're good. We don't need to grow. Uh, oh, man. I said, come again, preacher? He said, oh, no. I've got enough problems of my own. I don't need to grow and take on more problems. True story from a pastor. I don't want to grow... We want to stay like we are. Woo, yes. And you know what? When I heard that on the phone, I was ready to break some bricks because I was a little mad. Amen. Come on, somebody. I'm like, we're here. God put us on this earth to make a difference. We can't just sit and, well, take up space and breathe the oxygen up. Come on. Hey, God's given us time, talent, and treasure. Each one of us have a, a gifting and a talent. To use for His awesome, great glory. Now, here's something interesting about this story. As I read this, I want you to hear this. Now, it's going to talk about a man who's a paralytic, who's crippled, who cannot help himself. So his friends, his four friends, want to get him to Jesus, what I call, by any means necessary. I mean, they're going to go to the literal extreme to get him to... And you know what's ironic about this story? The man who needed to get to Jesus the most couldn't. Remember that pastor said, oh, we don't want to grow. Oh, we got ours. We're fine. A lot of churches, see, the crowd was prohibiting this man from getting to Jesus. We've got a lot of churches today in America prohibiting people from getting to Jesus as well. Because of their religion. Because of the way they do things. Well, you may have long hair. You might have a tattoo. You may have a piercing. And they look at him and say, well, your kind aren't welcome in our church. The, my, last I read, my Bible says we are to be called to be fishers of men, not cleaners of fish. We are not to be cleaners of the fish. Because the Holy Spirit, last I checked, does a pretty good job of convicting and he will push and he will nudge in his time. Come on, somebody. Now, that's just the truth of the matter. And watch this. Now, here's the thing. These four men were radical. They had vision. They were, they were so focused on getting their friend to Jesus. Watch this. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days. And it was noised that he was in the house. And can I make an announcement? When Jesus is in the house, things happen. See, a lot of times when we think we've got it all figured out, God says, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to change some things up for you. Come on, somebody. And straightway many were gathered together in so much that there was no more room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. Verse 3, And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof or dug through the hoof or bro broke through the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. 
When Jesus saw their faith, He said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Here's, here's, the, here's the kicker right here. But there were certain of the scribes who were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why doeth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise and take up thy bed and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. Verse 12, I love this. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Ooh, Father God, bless your word, bless your people, speak to hearts, change lives, Lord God. I pray people leave here differently than they've come in. May they never be the same again. And Lord, may we have a face-to-face -face encounter with you today. May I hide behind the cross in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. You know what's interesting about this passage at the very end? In one translation I read, it says, We've never seen anything like this before. You know what I hear every week I do a crusade from moms and dads? Steve, we have never seen anything like this before. You know what I finally realized 20 years of doing this? They're not talking about me breaking things. They're talking about, hey, three weeks ago a grandma brought her whole family. Alcoholics. Not only did they show up, but they all got saved and baptized. And she says, I never thought I would ever see this day. I never thought I would witness this on this side of heaven. Hey, three weeks ago, we had a mom brought her son addicted to methamphetamines. He gave his heart to the Lord. He got so radically turned on, started bringing his coworkers to church, getting them saved. Come on, somebody. Now, I love this story because you think about this. These four men had an insatiable appetite to get their friend to Jesus. What if we had that same attitude? To do whatever it would take. See... God's given us all just a little bit, a measure of faith. If you do what you can with what you have, where you're at, God will increase what you have. And He won't leave you where you're at. Now, I'm living proof of that. In this story, they're trying to get their friend to Jesus, but what? The Bible says the crowd's so large they can't even get near the door. Big crowd, amen? So these four men, they didn't get discouraged. They rolled up their sleeves said, we're going to get busy for God. We're going to get our friend to Jesus, just like tonight at 7 o'clock. Hey, well, I don't know. I could come. I'll pray about it. I'll think about it. No, we've got to roll up our sleeves, get on the phone, get on Facebook, get them here, because it's a life and death struggle for their soul. Because you know what eternity is? Too long to be wrong. Life is short. Death is sure. Sin is the cause. But Christ is the only cure for the disease called friends. Disease called... Uh, uh, let me tell you something. Sin separates us from God. There's a battle for men and women's souls tonight. And I believe eternity's in the balance. And so many people get caught up. Well, you know, I'll think about it, pray about it. We've got to be doers of the Word. Faith without works is dead. These four men, they climb to the top of a roof. They're like, oh, we can't get through the door? They bust through the roof. Come on, somebody. We bust a hole through this roof. How many think it just might get someone's attention? Come on. You know what? Let me tell you something. If I'd have been one of those four men, I'd have been like, man, praise God, we, we got the hole dug. But I would have been the guy who would have brought up, well, we're on the roof. How are we going to get our friend through the hole in the roof to Jesus? You can't just slide him off the mat through the hole in the roof, bless God. Amen? There had to be some creative thinking that day. They probably tied a rope or a twine to the one of the sheep, you know, just like this has four corners. They tied it to the corners of that mat and they lowered him in front of Jesus and they saw his faith. And I got to ask myself, does he see my faith to reach the lost at any cost? Does he see my faith to be a soul winner? Because faith without works is dead, ladies and gentlemen. It's not easy doing what I do. 
It's easy to turn around. Well, I'll just stay home this week, this month. I don't want to go out. But bless God, I want to have my reward in heaven. Praise the Lord. And you know what? I can relate to the men in this story. Ladies and gentlemen, I was born crippled. The doctor said I'd never walk. Holding all these world records, Brother Nick, who would have ever thought God would have picked someone like me to touch millions of lives all over the world? You're looking at a living, breathing miracle. People ask for miracles for today. You're looking at a miracle. I wore braces from my waist to my feet, 12 buckles down each side, huge waist belt, skinniest kid in my whole school. Folks, I had a speech impediment. I, I, I c couldn't t t talk. I, I, I stuttered. I was bullied. I was picked on. I was punched in the face. I was spit on at school. I was laughed at. I was told, you'll never make it. You know what my goal was? To play basketball in college and in high school. Wearing braces, 12 buckles. I walked, picked up one leg at a time. I looked funny. I walked funny. I couldn't talk. You know what everyone said? You can't. We'll never pick you. But I'm so glad my God doesn't pick like the world picks. Come on. My God takes the nobodies and makes somebodies. He takes losers and makes winners. He takes the impossible and makes it possible. Ladies and gentlemen, he had the first word. He'll have the last word, ladies and gentlemen. Let me tell you something, folks. When God pulls for you, no one can stop his favor and promotion on your life. And when God fixes something, he fixes it real good. I started working with a strength coach, a therapist in my school, and I began working with a speech therapist as well. And ladies and gentlemen, I had praying parents, glory to God. And we didn't quit. We didn't give up. And you know what? One day, those braces came off. You remember Forrest Gump movie, right? I was the original before the movie came out. And I'm wearing these braces like Forrest Gump, and I couldn't talk physically. I was just like him, couldn't walk. One day the embraces came off. I became the fastest track athlete in my school's history, captain of my high school basketball team. We went on, long story short, to be continued tonight, won a state championship, full-ride scholarship in Arkansas to play basketball. My dream became a reality. He healed my stuttering tongue. And ladies and gentlemen, he fixed me real good. Gained 130 pounds without steroids or strength-enhancing drugs. Praise God. Here I am breaking bricks. Started with John Jacobs in the original power team in the 90s. Started and then started Megaforce, and the rest is history. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, God picked me to touch millions of lives. God's picking you to touch lives wherever you're at. Me? A lot of people disqualify themselves. Well, I'm not called to the ministry. Oh, really? Do you have a neighbor? Do you have a Bible? You have a coffee pot. Welcome to full-time ministry, praise God. Come on, somebody. You don't have to be a platform preacher to be called to the ministry. You know what I've learned? Life is like a coin. You could spend that coin any way you want, but you can only spend it once. Woo, we only have one life to live, ladies and gentlemen. And I hear people all the time, Brother Nicky, well, I'm not called. I can't do what you do. I can't sing like she did. I don't teach Sunday school. I just I do church. Watch this. Walked into a church, Los Angeles, California, 4,000 members. I preached four services that morning. And I walked through the door, and every 10 feet was a doorway all around that whole sanctuary. You know what they had positioned at every door? A coffee bar. And you know what would happen when you walked through the door? They had grandmas posted at every coffee bar. Praise God. I love grandmas. Boy, you need, you need your prayer answered. You get a grandma praying and you watch them move heaven and earth. Amen. They have a special hotline to heaven. Amen. And man, and they would serve you your coffee, stir it, give you a Bible memory verse for the day. I was so impressed with this ministry. I asked the little grandma, I said, who's the, the head grandma over this whole grandma ministry here? Who, who? They said, that's Grandma Lois. She's right over there. And I ran. I said, praise God, Grandma Lois, how you doing? And the closer I got to Grandma Lois, the smaller she became, praise God. She was four foot two, but with that Holy Ghost honey bun, she was about six foot ten, amen. She had some big hair, praise God. And I mean, she was full of the Spirit of God. And I put my arm around her. I said, Grandma Lois, I am, an, I am honored to meet you, ma'am. What a ministry you have here. This is, and they were so full of the, of the love of the Lord. They were just loving on people. You know what she tried to do? Disqualify her ministry. She said, well, it's not like your ministry, Brother Steve. You're on TV. You're famous. You win millions to the Lord. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, Grandma Lois, you don't understand. 
you serving a cup of coffee is as important as Steve breaking a brick for Jesus. God doesn't compare us or compete us against each other. God's called us to make a difference. And she started to cry. She said, no one's ever said that before. And she gave me a big old kiss on the cheek. Man, just made my day. I said, now you go serve coffee. You keep hugging necks and loving people. Ladies and gentlemen, what they were doing is holding the rope, getting another person close to Jesus. That's what God's called us all to be and do in the church. Not The church isn't a building made with hands. The church, the body of Christ, is you and I. Amen? Come on. God's called us here to make a difference. Not just, well, it's going to be okay. We're on our way to heaven. Well, who are we taking with us to heaven? These four men were in desperation. And if it took breaking through a roof, come on. How many know that took some effort? Well, it takes effort to get people to a revival meeting like tonight. Amen? That's whatever it takes. But ladies and gentlemen... As radical as that is, my friend who's six foot two, two seventy five, hand to hand combat specialist, Bill Henderson, big head of curly blonde hair, piercing blue eyes. Now I gotta tell you about this man. I might have mentioned it last time, but this guy was a karate expert. You know what he did for fun? He went to, to Mardi Gras to beat people up. He was he ran angel dust from LA to Mexico. You know who he fought for? The Hell's Angels. This dude was a bad dude, and his brother Ken, they were eight degree black belts in karate and hand to hand combat, ish and roof style. And they would go beat people up at Mardi Gras and walk out with not a scratch on them. These guys were rough, tough, and you know what Bill had? <laughs> he had a praying grandma. He'd bring food to her assisted living every day, and she'd make him sit down and say, Billy, sit down, son. Hell's angel, right? I want to talk to you about Jesus. And one day, son, you're going to preach the gospel around the world. And he had a really rough voice from doing a lot of drug use. And he'd say, Grandma, I don't want to hear about Jesus. That's a crutch. You don't tell Grandma that. She said, Son, he's not a crutch. Religion isn't a crutch. Jesus is the whole hospital. He's the wheel in the middle of the wheel, son. He's everything. He's all we have in this world. And she began to preach to Bill. And he gave her a kiss and said, Grandma, i got to go. What he meant was he was going to do another drug deal. And you know what she said? Jesus loves you, this I know, for my Bible tells me so. And she would sing that song to him every time he'd come over. He gets on his Harley. He goes off to the hotel, put his bulletproof, Shield on, had his guns, knives, ready to go, tattoos from his, all up his arms, his neck, biggest forearms I've ever seen on a guy. This dude was bad to the bone. And he stood, this, this is part of his testimony now, he would stand in front of the mirror and he would stand and look at his face and he'd take a deep breath because he knew this could be the last one. He never knew if he'd be killed. And he put his game face on. He was rugged, he was rough, he was tough. And you know what he saw when he looked in the mirror? You know what he heard? Billy, Jesus loves you. This I know. For my Bible tells me so. Son, one day you will preach the gospel around the world. And that day he dropped to his knees. And he cried out to an almighty God and said, If you're real, like my grandma says so, save me. I've hurt people. I've killed people. I'm a drug dealer, God. How could, could you save someone like me, like grandma? He didn't get saved. He didn't get saved. Brother Nicky, he got radically saved. This dude, as radical as he was for Jesus, he was 200% more radical for God, the things of God. I thought I was a radical rope holder. This dude was a rope holding machine. He would get, he, I took him on a crusade with me. He got saved. He started traveling with me. We went to a pizza hut one night. I kid you not, 250 people in a pizza hut. No one sees him. We have 15 pastors at the table, eight pizzas in the middle of the table. We're just talking about God, how good God is, and we're just talking, fellowshipping, and Bill hasn't spoken in an hour. And I know Bill. Okay, he's saved, but rough around the edges. Can I get an amen, somebody? He was full of, the, you know, zealous for God. He was just a little rough. He didn't say nothing. I'm thinking in my mind, man, I hope he does not do anything weird. Because I felt nervous because he wasn't talking the whole night. And the pastor started going, is he okay? Is Bill all right? Is... All of a sudden, out of the blue, and I knew it was coming. True story. Hey, guys, I feel... real rough, deep. I feel led of the Lord to do something great. 
Move the pizza from the table. I wear size 15 inch shoe. Big feet, right? And they are great for kicking. The pastors didn't see me do this, but I did do this under the table. I kicked him and said, not now. I said, don't do anything weird, man. Just relax. You don't tell that to Bill Henderson because this dude looks at me and says, I feel led of the Lord to do something great. And how many know Mama didn't raise no dummy and I did not want him to fall into the B.C. days before Christ again. Hand-to-hand -hand combat. We, we, we removed the, all the pizzas from the middle of the table. Pastors are wondering, what in the world? What are they doing? And six foot two, 275 pounds, all of them, tattoos, big head of curly blonde hair. I could not. I sunk in my chair when I saw him. And the pastors are just sitting there and they're like, what's he doing? He jumps on the table and screams, emergency! 250 people in Pizza Hut are choking on pizza. They don't know what's going on. They're like, what is this crazy tattooed nut doing? He says, tonight if you don't know Jesus, you could die and go to an eternal prison called hell. It's an emergency you receive Jesus. Right. He's preaching on a table in Pizza Hut, gives an altar call. Half of Pizza Hut comes forward to receive Jesus. And the pastors look at me and say, well, all right then. Praise the Lord. The manager of Pizza Hut gets saved, gets rid of his cigarettes and nicotine and chew and throws it on the ground. He gets delivered from nicotine addiction for over 20 years. Praise God. And Bill's ministering and praying. And before we judge him, though, the Bible says those who are forgiven much love much. Amen? He'd been forgiven a lot of crazy stuff. Now, let me just say this. The chances of me or Pastor Nicky doing that probably zero. We're relational guys. We like to get to know people first. Amen? But this dude was radical for God. He had been forgiven of so much. And he wanted to give God so much. Man, and he had a little girl named Jessica. She was radical for God. Big head of curly blonde hair. Shirley Temple. Movie star personnel. Cutest kid I've ever seen. And this guy would bring her to our crusades, put her on his shoulders. They'd go to a street corner, and I've seen him do it in a hotel lobby and in an elevator. She'd sit on his shoulders. Daddy, should I tell him or should you tell him? He'd go, I don't know. Should you tell him or should I tell him, baby girl? I don't know, Daddy. Should you tell And they'd go back and forth for 15 minutes. I saw 100 to 200 people get around him, and they're doing this back and forth thing. Should I tell him or should you? Finally... After seeing Bill, someone in the crowd would have the guts and courage enough to t say this. Tell us. Tell us what? Tell us. Jessica, I watched her. Now watch. She goes, I'll tell you all right. My daddy used to be a mean man and beat people up. And he doesn't beat people up anymore because he has Jesus in his heart. And he used to do a lot of dope deals. But now we do a lot of hope deals. And, and, and my daddy doesn't beat people up and he's not mean anymore because he loves Jesus. And maybe all of you need to get to know Jesus too. Oh my gosh. Whole crowds would get saved. I was amazed. You talk about rope holders. You talk about radical. You talk about out of the box evangelism. They were first class. Sometimes bad things happen a little tough to tell this part, but she comes down with leukemia, blood disease, blood cancer. Whew, man. We have people praying for her, man, to get healed. It went into remission twice. Lost all her hair, skinny, just skin and bones. Whew, she's in the hospital and we're praying for God to heal her. God's a miracle worker. Whew, I'm living proof. But I know one thing, some are healed down here, but everybody's going to he be healed up there one day. Everybody, streets of gold, no more pain, no more tears. She's holding her dad's hand. She's seven years old. Now, in a seven-year-old's words, she said, Daddy, I hate the devil. The devil did this to me by Jesus' stripes. I'm healed. That's what she said. She closed her eyes. She went to be with Jesus. They took her body down a big freight elevator and wheeled her in down at the, in the morgue, and Bill, through all the commotion, he, he's consoling everybody. Oh, it's okay. She's with Jesus. No more cancer. It's going to be all right. God's in it. God, and everyone's just like, wow, the faith of this God. Man. 
He had a bottle of oil going around anointing people, praying for people in the room. His daughter just died. Hours had passed by all the commotion. He realized he did not get to say a proper goodbye. He asked the head nurse, can I go see my baby one more time? Just please. She said, sure, Bill, follow me. They go down. They see the freight elevator. Opens up. She puts it in, locks it. They go down. The door opens. And they, they come to this freezer. She opens this big door. And there's a metal table. And there's a sheet over a little body. Jessica's right there. Now you got to know Bill. He just walks over, pulls the sheet back, picks her up, and he's just talking to her. Baby, I love you. I miss you. I'm going to see you real soon. You know what he said? This isn't goodbye. I'm going to see you a little bit later. It's only temporary, baby. You give Jesus a big hug and a kiss, Daddy's going to see you real soon. I miss you so much. The nurse is bawling. She can't hold it together. And she says, Sir, I don't mean to interrupt you at this time, but I don't understand it. How can someone like you have peace? And how do you praise God when I bring other parents here, they curse God? Oh, you praise God. They curse God. They shake their fist at God. They blame God. And they scream at God. And you're happy? How? 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 Now, at this time, he had laid his baby right back on that table. You know what he said, man? We who are Christians don't weep as the world would weep. Because we're going to see our loved ones again one day. We're going to see them in glory one day. It's just temporary. You know what she said? I go to a church down the road. Been there 22 years. I don't know the Jesus you know. She goes, I know, I know of Jesus, but I don't know the Jesus you know. He said, ma'am, you want to know him right now? Rope holder, out of the box. Any opportunity, old Bill Henderson said, ma'am, you can know him right here, right now, would you? She said, now? He said, there is no tomorrow. He said, today is the day of salvation. Now's the acceptable time. And you know what he said? He went to his baby. Baby, should I tell her or should you tell her? Since you're with Jesus, daddy's going to do this one more time for you and your honor, baby. Ma'am, may I have your hand, please? He grabbed both of her hands, led her in the sinner's prayer, walked her through the Roman's road, and let her know what it meant to be a rope holder, to be a Christian, to be blood-bought, to have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, to know who Jesus is. Hey, he told her, we're all sinners in need of a Savior. We're all lost and needed to be found. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that day she prayed that prayer. That's the last time they did the skit. Steve, why do you say that story? I tell you that because in her death, in her life, she knew what it meant to hold the rope, to get one more person close to Jesus at any cost, in death and in life. And so that makes me think, what's my excuse? Oh, I got to get on another plane. I got to get on another train. I got to get on my fifth wheel and drive to another city. What's my excuse? If I have air in my lungs, I want to hold the rope. If I have air in my lungs, I want to get people close to Jesus. If I have air in my lungs, I don't want to make excuses. I want to give Him praise. If I have air in my lungs, I want to do what I can with what I have where I'm at and give God all the glory. Amen? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? If you're here today and Jesus is not, I repeat, is not the premier attraction of your life, I have an announcement to make. It's not safe to leave here. If you're here today and you need to touch from heaven, if you're here today and you need to put Jesus first in your life, if you're here today and you're doing things Jesus would never do, it's an emergency. Because I'm going to count to three. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Nobody moving. Please don't leave. This is important. With heads bowed, eyes closed, there's a battle for your soul today. Heaven pulls, hell pulls. Right now, right here, you're going to make a decision. And I'm going to count to three. If you need a touch from heaven, if you need forgiveness, if you need to be born again, if you need your name written in the Lamb's book of life, praise God, there is no tomorrow. The devil's favorite word isn't a curse word. It's tomorrow. Today's the day. Now is the time. I'm out of time. I've got to pray. But this is your moment. Don't dare let it pass you by. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. This prayer is for men, women, boys, 
girls, if you need forgiveness on the count of three, if you need a brand new start, if you need your slate wiped clean, I pray today is your day. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. I don't want to miss one person. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You feel the tug of the Holy Spirit. Thank God. Don't put it off. Because if you do, you'll get better at doing it. Trust me, I know. I did it. But this is an emergency. 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 I'm out of time. I'm going to pray. When I get to the number three, if you want this prayer to count for you, no one's looking. It's between you and God. Maybe you're saying things Jesus would never say. Maybe you look at things Jesus would never look at. Maybe you go where Jesus would never go. I pray today you'd settle it once and for all. The Bible says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the Bible also says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is your moment. Don't dare let it pass you by. I don't want to miss one person. On the count of three, if you want this prayer to count for you, shoot that hand straight up. I'll see your hand. I'll count you in the prayer. Are you ready? The Holy Spirit's tugging at hearts. One. Two. Three. Slip it up quickly. Thank you. Quickly. Shoot that hand straight up. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? Quickly, quickly, quickly. Hands are going up. Thank you, ma'am. Anybody else? Quickly. You're saying yes to Jesus. I'll follow him. Anybody else? Quickly. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Anybody else? Thank you, ma'am. Quickly, quickly. I don't want to miss one person. We're going to close in a word of prayer. I don't want to miss one. anyone else. Thank you, sir. Thank you, young man. Anybody else? You're doing business with God. You're not ashamed of the gospel. You're saying, I will follow him. Anyone else? Thank you. Quickly, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You may put those hands down. With heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody moving. I want, to re I want to lead you in this simple, powerful prayer so no one's embarrassed. I want everyone to repeat this little prayer after me. But more importantly than saying it, mean it from your hearts today. Pray this to the Lord. Would everyone out loud, would you just say, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And be my very best friend. Today, I am yours. And today, Lord, you are mine. I'll never be the same. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. Today, Lord, give me the courage and the strength to follow you. Today is the first day of the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Can we do it? Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. You know what? Just a minute ago, I saw hands going up. Men, women, boys and girls. And you know what? If you raised your hand, guess what? At the end of the service, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give, give a chance for you to do a, a winner's lap. How many know in the Olympics they do a winner's lap? Come on. And you, they raise the country's flag and they take a lap for their country. Well, at the end of the service, guess what? We're going to do a winner's lap for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The Bible says, taste and see the Lord is good, and we're going to cheer you on. Always, People say, well, what will people think? Who cares? I, think, I care what God thinks. I don't want to be a, a, God, a man pleaser. I want to be a God pleaser. Amen? So at the very end of the service, I'm going to be right here in the middle. And what we're going to do is we're going to have an awesome winner's lap, and I'm going to ask men to stand if their wives wouldn't. I'm going to ask women that raise their hands to stand if your husband wouldn't. I'm going to ask young people to stand in just a second if your friends wouldn't. Why, Steve? Because one day we're going to stand before God all alone anyway. We might as well stand right here right now where we're going to get cheered on. Amen? Bless God. Give the Lord a hand. Now, here's what I want to do. I want the ushers to be in the back and hold for a minute. I want, to share, I want everyone's attention. I want you to look right here for a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, I mentioned at the beginning of the service, we're in a battle for our kids. I said we're in a battle for our kids. And i got to tell you, I have not seen what I've seen in 20 years like I've seen now. We've got kids bringing handguns to school, cutting their wrists. Self-cutting is at an epidemic proportion. Come on. Alcoholism out of control. Did you hear about the kids that, that, that they did this punching thing and killed 10 elderly people? Have you heard, heard about that, the sucker punching thing on Facebook? Kids are punching ki elderly and killing them. And, that, and they were in junior high school. Folks, we've got a generation with no conscience. And you know what? We better, we better stand up and take, 
People say, yeah, now think about it, 40 years ago, what were the worst problems in school? Being late for class, throwing spit wads, and what? Chewing gum. Boy, have we come a long way. Gang violence, alcoholism, drug addiction, suicide, second leading killer of our kids. Now watch this. People say, how did that happen? One single woman. God took Jesus right out of the school, and the church stayed home. It's time for the church to stand up, to speak up, to get fired up, and it's time to take our kids and our grandkids back for God. Come on, somebody. It's time to take them back for Jesus Christ. You know what, folks? Hey, when I go into a school, a young person says, Hey, thanks for what you said today. I'm not going to kill myself. How many know that's a little motivation to keep going? And you know what, folks? Those kids I go to, I go to the roughest schools in America. They don't have a church like this. Those kids, Pastor Nikki, they don't have a pastor like him. And you know what, folks? They have nobody to encourage them. They have no one in their corner. The Bible says, if you pull for the little one, if you've done it to them, you've done it to me. Come on. How many think we need to pull for these kids in this generation? I walked into a middle school. And I spoke for 45 minutes. Seventh grade girl on the front row did not move for 45 minutes, and that's weird to me. My assembly's high energy. She didn't move. Guess what? I went up to her. I said, hey, how'd you like the assembly? Looked at me, Brother Nikki. She said, what do you care? I said, I don't know you. What do you care what I feel about? I realized she was wearing wristbands. It was 100 degrees that day and a long sleeve jacket, and I knew exactly what was going on. I knew she was a self-cutter. Sure enough, I asked her, would you come tonight? You know what she said? My daddy's an agnostic. He doesn't believe in God. She said he cur the only way I've heard him mention God's name is a curse word out of his mouth. And she said, my mama's a dope fiend. She doesn't go to church. She shoots up every single day. I said, we'll get you a ride. She got, we got her a ride front row with her volleyball teammates, all six girls. That night, Ray Ray Santos was her name. She showed up, and let me tell you, she got radically saved. All of her friends got saved. And you know what? That next night brought her mom. Her mama got saved. Last night of the crusade, six foot five, 350 pounds. He was standing in the back, cigarettes rolled up in his shirt, tattoos, long hair, Mean as the Texas rattlesnake, come on. And I preached how God's a father to the fatherless. That man ran forward, dropped to his knees, cried out to an almighty God. And you know what? He got radically saved and said, this week was the week I was divorcing my wife, leaving my whole family. Ray Ray came up to me. People say, why do you do what you do? That's why. The razor blade she was using to cut her wrist with. She gave it to me as a memorial. And I want everyone to look right here. Nobody move. She apologized for being rude to me. She pulled her wristbands, showed me her scars. And she said this in this note. Here's what it says. This is the razor I used to cut myself with when no one was around. I don't need any more. I know God loves me and has a plan for my life. He's taught me to stand tall, not let the world and the devil take me down one more day. You are my hero. How many know I've got to keep going to the schools? I said, how many know i got to get more razor blades, more bullets, more safety pins? And I want everyone to look right here. You see this school? You know the school I went to to see Ray Ray? It cost me $500 to go to one public school. And you know what this school said? We don't have the money. But bless God, one of the grandmas from First Baptist Church, she marched up to the school and she said, I hear you have no money and I hear you don't want him to come because he's a Christian. To the principal with no appointment, walked in. He said, oh, I'm so sorry. She wrote a check for $500 in the name of her family. Her grandkids were away from God. And you know what? I was able to go to that school and get a razor blade and make a difference. How many think that's pretty awesome a grandma would do that? Amen? So you know what? See this envelope right here? Every one of you are getting one of these envelopes. This is how I go to the public schools. Out of the 200 schools this year, over half of them will have no sponsorship. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. When you get this envelope, see this? We've never had to turn one school down because they don't have finances. You know why? Because God spoke to my heart and said, let the same people Sunday morning that send a missionary to Africa send Steve to America's public schools. And you want to hear something powerful? I haven't had to turn down one school in over 16 years. Praise God. And how many know it bothered me? There were a lot of schools that couldn't afford to bring me with the barbed wire up. They can't afford to bring Steve. But you know what? God's people 
know how to sponsor God's program. Amen? So t- today, everybody here, you're going to have this envelope. And I want you to take your checkbook out, your billfold, and I want you to give the devil a black eye today. And I'm getting ready to go to Covington, Louisiana, Ponchatoula. I'm getting ready to go to Orlando, Florida, where the shooting was, near the shooting, and go to all these schools. And if you're making a check today, I'm praying for a businessman or woman today. Maybe you could sponsor a school for $500 in the name of your family. Maybe in the name of your business. Maybe in the name of your whole business. We had a businessman two weeks ago sponsor two schools. He's the owner of a supermarket down in in, uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. So I'm going to ask everyone here, even the young people, to get an envelope. And maybe you could sponsor half of a school for $250. Maybe 10 or 20 people could give $100. And you know what that will do? Send me to the schools that can't afford it. How many think it's awesome that we can do it this way? Amen? And I don't have to charge the schools to come. Amen? Because it's not easy doing. Ushers, have we passed everyone? Got If you need a pen, raise your hand. Just make your check to Megaforce if you would do that. You can give by credit card. Uh, if, I'm going to even ask young people to give to the Lord today. A lot of people say, uh, well, you know, kids can't give to God. Well, they made Madonna a millionaire. What about Pokemon? Pokemon's a billionaire, amen? That's all we're hearing about now. So everyone, take out your checkbook, your bill full. If you need an envelope, raise your hand. If you need a pen, raise your hand. But you're God's first team in sponsoring missions all over the world. So I want everyone to pull for this generation. How many think we got to pull for these kids, amen? Um, every Power Sunday, I believe God for five school assemblies to come in. That's what I pray for. Between the morning and night service, I pray for God to send a hero. And I'm believing for four or five heroes that will step up and say, you know what, hey, do we have any elementary kids in here today or middle school? Elementary school student, come up here. Middle school student. I need a high school student. Come up here quick. Hurry, hurry. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. Don't be shy. I'm not going to embarrass you. Come on. Middle school, high school, and I need an elementary school student. Any elementary, high school? I'm getting ready to go to Covington, Louisiana. The high school, the elementary school, you're given to them, not to me. You're given to these guys. Now watch this. If we don't pull for this generation, who's going to do it? How many of you could go in a school and stop suicide and drug addiction? How many of you would say something to them? Come on, I know you would because you're God's people. But how many know you've got to be where they're at? Come on, somebody. And you know what? I'm going to be where they're at over 200 times, and this is how I make it. So make your check to Megaforce. You're sending me to reach these young people, the high school, the middle school kids. I'll be in front of a million teenagers face to face. And how many know we need to have a burden for these? Maybe our family, they're good. Maybe our kids are loving Jesus. But there's a lot of kids, they don't have this kind of church and this kind of pastor and parents like you. And you know what? They need someone in their corner encouraging them. Amen? And I'm that voice. So make your check to Megaforce. If you're making a check, make it to Megaforce. And you'll get a tax receipt. If you want to give by credit card, some people prefer to give that way. That's perfectly fine. That's between you and the Lord. If you want to give by cash, I want everyone to do something. Something that moves you today. Amen? Let's hold our envelopes and let's pray. Father God, thank you for the opportunity. And Lord, I pray that moms, dads, businessmen, businesswomen here would just pull for this generation. I pray for those five heroes to step up and knock it out of the park today. Lord God, I pray they'd hold the rope financially for Megaforce Ministries and send me to the mission field. But Lord, I can't go unless I'm sent there. So Lord, I pray you bless them for their sacrificial giving. And I pray, Lord, if their young person is away from the Lord, maybe their kid or their grandchildren aren't serving God, Lord, I pray as they send me to reach other families that you would bring that miracle to their house. So bless them for their sacrificial giving. In Jesus' mighty name, and all God's people said, Amen. Again, if you're making a check, make it to Megaforce. If you want to give by credit card, you can do it. Give my kids a big hand clap. You can have a seat. Thank you, guys. <laughs> I want to say thank you for.